You can't just lump things into two categories. Things aren't that simple. The lifeline is divided that way. But you're not listening to me. There are other things that need to be taken into account here, like the whole spectrum of human emotion. You can't just lump everything into these two categories and then just deny everything else. It's really important to me to highlight the dualistic nature of much of the content of Christian thinking because it's drawing from a really important writings in the Newer Testament. Paul's thought is heavily dualistic and it's, it's right or wrong. It's you're with us or you're against us. That's a very prevalent framework within Christian writings. And so when people today uphold that way of thinking, I want to be really compassionate about that, but I also want to be clear that it's not mature. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat for in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. You can eat whatever you want in the kitchen. Just don't touch that cookie jar in the corner. You, most people think that because that's how they've been taught to read it. Why would God not want us to have the knowledge of good and evil? I don't think that God does want us to be kept from that. When you look at what then the serpent does say to the human, the first, the female, you know, he's not, he's not being deceitful either. And that's the, that's the piece that kind of really irritates me is that Paul says that the serpent is being deceitful, but really the serpent is being honest. Today I have the privilege to interview Professor Jennifer Grace Bird, PhD from Vanderbilt University with a Master of Divinity from Princeton Theological Seminary. She is a professor at the University of Portland and has written a number of books that I have listed in the description, including the book we're talking about today, which is Permission Granted. Right now, before we even get into anything, go and subscribe to her YouTube channel. Hit the pause button, go there, subscribe, hit the bell, and then come back. Also, two books that I want to recommend that have to do with the subject matter of today's interview. The Quest for the Historical Satan by Miguel de Tora and Albert Hernandez. Also, Religions of the Hellenistic Roman Age by Antonia Triplitus. All the links are in the description, plus a bunch of videos that are related to this from Professor Bird's YouTube channel. It is a priceless resource for scholarly information on the stuff that we talk about in this channel. Lastly, there's also a Facebook link in the description as well for a book giveaway that Professor Bird will be explaining in just a moment. Enjoy. Welcome back to the Gnostic Informant and you are about to attain true Gnosis. And today I'm with Dr. Jennifer Bird. And as you've seen in the intro, uh, lots of links to check out, lots of books to check out, and we're going to get right into it. How are you doing today? Sounds good. I'm doing all right, Neil. How are you? Good, good. Um, before we start, do you want to tell us about the giveaway that you're doing on Facebook? Oh, sure. Yeah. I, I'm i giving away, I have about 50 copies of the book that I'm giving away to anyone who can check the one of the six categories that I'll list on a post on Facebook tomorrow. It's on my personal page. And I'm happy to pop it in the mail. It'll be there by next week. If you're interested, that's what it's for. If you're interested, giving them away. So. Awesome. I put a link in the description for the Facebook page that you can go to. Great. Thank you. And, uh, yeah. So let's let's get right into it. The book Permission Granted, which is I think is a must read if you're into biblical studies or comparative religion. It's yeah, it's it's up there. It's one of the it's one of the good it's one of the best ones. Thank you. Thank you. And um <clears throat> Yeah, let's, I want to I ask you some questions about it. First thing that comes to mind when, when, I, when I think of this book that stood out to me is uh, the chapter you did about Adam and Eve and the serpent. Mm -hmm. And so you mentioned that there's a, the serpent does not actually deceive Eve, but maybe it's God that does. <laughs> Isn't that fun? <laughs> It's very a little uncomfortable at first, maybe, for depending on who your audience is, right? Yeah, unless you're yeah. Gnostic. Well, the ancient Gnostics, this was a, a common common thing. Right, 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 right. Yeah, um, I was a little bit tripped off that, like, tripped up that you would, like, you're going to achieve true gnosis. I'm like, oh, yeah, okay, we're going to talk about some knowledge. Yes, we are. Let's do that. Um, yeah, you know, it's funny because, as you are well aware, right, 
what people think about Genesis chapters two and three in particular are pretty important. So I think having a kind of a reasonable conversation about it and kind of breaking it down a little bit is really helpful. But specifically to your question, when there, there are two primary ways that I think of people reading this particular story about the creation of the first two humans. So when we look at Genesis, the first 11 chapters, we're looking at a lot of mythic content, which was scary for me to hear about at first, and it took me years to be comfortable with. But what we mean is people are telling stories about the world, and in particular, some element of interaction with the god or gods in the world that they believe in. And what we, what I grew up thinking of as one creation story, that included seven days of creation and then God forming a human out of the dirt and all that. Those are actually two separate stories. And I actually think that we end up honoring these stories much more when we read them as two separate stories and let them do what each is trying to do. And what a very common thing that has happened in the Christian tradition is to read them as one complete story. And the common way to do that is to say that the first story is about the ideas and the forms. And then the second is when God puts it all on the earth, like this very, without people realizing it, very platonic ideas and forms right. thing, right? Yeah. And then, and then it gets all personal and, you know, dirty and whatever in the second chapter. And that's a pretty common way to read the make it try to make sense as one. But if we pull them apart and say, this is one version of telling the story of creation. And then this is a second one and they are different. And let's just let them be. You actually get more out of them that way. So when we're talking, you were referring to chapters two and three of Genesis, the second creation story that starts with forming a human out of the dirt. It's not a male, it's a human. That was one of the mind blowing things for me when I looked at the Hebrew for myself in seminary. So it's a male, it's not a male, it's a human. And right, so yeah, so, and then once you have two humans at the verse 22 and 23, when God pulls the rib out and makes a second, once you have two, that's where the introduction of male and female comes in. Wow. But yeah, yeah. And then that makes this very different take on that part of the story. Um, but you were asking about, so I was trying to set the bigger scene there, but you were asking oh, yeah. about, yeah, who is lying, who's deceiving whom, right, in this story. And so one of the things that's important to me, at least to point out, is when we think about Genesis, the content, especially the first 11 chapters in Genesis, when we think of that as mythic content, what that invites us to do is is to try not to think of this as historically accurate, which is understandable that a lot of people do. So I, I'm never, I'm never interested. I'm, I'm interested in, in not doing any kind of making fun of people for what they think and believe, because I used to think of it as historically accurate. I used to think of this stuff as this really went down. And I believed that because that's what I grew up thinking. And it wasn't until someone gave me a chance to th look at it differently and, and reconsider that I think of it differently now. So there's no judgment here, right? We're just right. making observations, right? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I think so, it, I, it makes me appreciate it more when I can take a step back and not be so literal about it. it makes yes. me appreciate the text a lot more. Right. Right. It, it kind of comes alive in a different way. Like yeah. it's having a conversation with us instead of. So what happens so I'm going to turn to the text to refer to this who's deceiving whom question. I always do this. I refer to the Hebrew here, formed ha-adam, because that's a generic human, not specifically a male. Um, and then the English translations turn that human into a male when they say formed a man. And a human could mean generic, but man tells us English hearers that this is a male that was created first, and it's not a male who's created first. So the Lord God formed Adam from Adama, the dust of the ground, breathed into its nostrils the breath of life. Adam became a living being, and the Lord God planted a garden. And in the whole thing about the garden, out of the ground, the Lord God made to grow everything, every tree that's pleasant to the sight, good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so then we skip down to verse 15. The Lord God took Ha'adam and put it in the garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded Ha'adam 
you may freely eat of every tree of the garden. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat for in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. <laughs> so Christian tradition has taken this first step and they've treated it historically accurately instead of as a story, right? So if we're looking at this as a myth instead, what, what's going on here, right? We could, part of what helps us to get to that is who in our world today doesn't have the knowledge of good and evil? Right. Right. So, um, infants, uh, right. I try to talk about this with students. I'm like, well, sometimes sociopaths qualify, but they actually usually know and just don't care. Right. <laughs> right? So the, the thing is we're, many of us at least were taught to just agree with and read with and, and all of, and we're taught that this is all like God makes sets, sets a boundary and the humans disobey. And so they blew it. But let's take a minute to think about the boundary that's being set and why is that being said? What is, what's going on there? If to, why would God, why would God say, you can eat whatever you want in the kitchen. Just don't touch that cookie jar in the corner. And I don't think it's in the corner. They can start in the middle. If I'm not mistaken. Right, 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 right. That's true, right? <laughs> <laughs> or right in front of your face. The heart of things, yeah. right? But um, I don't know. That is such a good question. Why would he do that? That's, exactly. the, that's the big question, right? It is. And, and people say, well, God is testing humans to make sure they will be faithful and obedient. And I get that. But you, most people think that because that's how they've been taught to read it. Why would God not want us to have the knowledge of good and evil? I don't think that God does want us to be kept from that. Because think of what it adds to us as humanity. It's one of the primary things, aside from opposable thumbs, that differentiates us from other animals is this right. conscience. And, and you know what I noticed about that is this maybe then maybe the, I'm not sure if this is what the author intended or not. Right. But to get like real deep for a second, if you think about it, animals in the wild sort of just they're not like conscious that they're going to they're going to die. They're not like thinking my life's going to end one day. I better do all these things. They're just doing what's in front of them. Like, like an insect, they literally just keep walking until they find a prey. And, then, and they find a prey or, or they get preyed on. And that's right. it. That's right. the whole entire life. That is their existence. And they don't, they're not conscious of like, oh, I'm going to die one day. They're not thinking of heaven and hell and all these deep concepts. Right. We're, sort, we're sort of burdened with that because we have to, re, we have to like bring, we have to carry it with us. One day I'm going to die. Oh, I have to bury my grandparents. I have to do all these. It's, these are all dark, sad things that we have to deal with that most other animals don't really deal with. Right, right. So I, I wonder if that's where they were getting at, maybe. That we, yeah. it's just a way of life, maybe. Like, exactly. Why is this a part of human existence? And so this is an element. I'm jumping in because this is kind of how I well, go at it. Is yeah. This is an element of human existence. Why did God burden us with this or whatever? where where did this piece come from and really when you look at myths stories that are myths they are trying to give some sort of a backstory or an origin story for an element that we can't otherwise explain and that's what the story about the rainbow is at in one of the two flood stories in chapter six through nine you know chapter six through nine is actually two different flood stories that have been blended together and one of the thing one of the outcomes of one of those stories is a rainbow in the sky like explaining where rainbows come from. So, you know, I, I first read from a rabbi that this is more like a step up for humanity, not a fall. And I, I was set free by that. Like, what? I love that. This, the, this is trying to give a playful or childlike story that explains why God didn't try to protect us from this part of human of human experience or how it came about that God allowed us to have this sometimes cumbersome thing called a conscience, you know? So, so if we read this as historically accurate, then God is saying something to the first human that isn't actually true because in the day that you eat of it, you shall die is not actually true. That doesn't right. come true. When they right. eat, they don't. Yeah. And and again, people will turn that into, well, they mean that meant that that humans lost their eternal life in that day. 
And that also isn't true. That's the thing I love about this whole thing is if you read Genesis two and three on their own, just let it read it through, let it say what it's saying. By the end of Genesis three, we see that God says, oh, and by the way, <laughs> if we're not careful. The humans are going to reach out and eat from the tree of life and also live forever. And we don't want that. Like the early church fathers read disobedience and this issue of sinfulness because of being disobedient onto and into this story so well that the Christian tradition believed it and held onto it and perpetuated it. And so, so it is quite natural for most Christians today to see that, to think and believe that the first two humans were being disobedient bleep holes, right? Like, I don't want to curse on your, on your show, but I have a hard time sometimes not cursing. No, okay. um, uh, right. So we're, ta we're taught to read it that way. So either God is lying and deceiving in order to make this whole thing work, or let's take a step back and let's just let it be this setup. How else do you set up the scene? Right. So I think that if we're going to talk about somebody deceiving someone, it's God. The only reason it even becomes an issue, though, is because of Paul in the Newer Testament reading back into Genesis 3 that the serpent deceived Eve and became and she became a sinner. So really, you know, this is it. You know, it's not the thing is Jews don't make a big deal about sinfulness. And specifically, they do not make a big deal of this chapter, these two chapters. That's a very particular Christian thing. Yeah. So. And it's like, and then another thing to think about, too, is like when you have a creator who is all knowing, who is omni, omni, omni. OK, yeah. Creates these beings who, have, who don't know anything. They're just like babies, basically. Almost you have to almost wonder. Why would the blame go on? Like, imagine if you had two children that are like one years old and they like, I don't know, like stole a candy bar or something. I, I mean, are you really going to get, are you going to condemn them eternally for that? Or you, maybe you're going to do some parenting and try to fix the situation, right? Like, I, I and mean, there's a lot of things that I think about when I read this. Mm -hmm. what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I agree that, um, one of the way, you know, the way we're taught to kind of see this is this is who God is and this is how God handles problems and this is how he fixes problems is by just starting over. And he has like he has kind of a bit of a short temper and not very creative problem solving skills. You know, <laughs> it's like maybe we don't want to actually think about God as being that. Right. And right. what that then leads us to is let's look at this through the lens of myth. And so sure. if you do that, then nobody's really lying to anybody. It's just the best setup they could come up with in chapter two. It becomes an origin story. Yeah. And it's just it becomes like a an explanation of why yes. we're in the situation we're in. Yes, exactly. It's like, it's like the Tower of Babel. It's like, OK, if you think it literally happened, it's like, well, first of all, you have a lot of we need to sit down and we need to have a conversation about history because that's not <laughs> what happened. That's not how language just got spread out. Right. So, but if you actually look at the Tower of Babel story, and it's like, well, the ancients were trying to explain why all these different people are speaking different languages. Yes. Yes. Then, okay. Now it makes sense. Now it's just, right. just a playful story now. Exactly. Yeah. People right across the river speak differently and have different cultures or practices than we do. Where did that come from? Right. 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 Yeah. 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 And, so, yeah. you know, yeah. So, you know, the other piece then is is to kind of follow through with that question. It isn't even so much that, you know, not, well, well, I don't want to make too big a deal of it. But when you look at what then the serpent that does say to the human, the first the female, you know, he's not he's not being deceitful either. And that's the that's the piece that kind of really irritates me is that Paul says that the serpent is being deceitful, but really the serpent is being honest. And that very, is what, very honest, right? Everything, everything the serpent says is actually true. If you think about it, exactly. They and eat, they eat from the tree, they become like God because remember their eyes are opened up. Exactly. They, they don't die. Right. And so he, what did he say? It's a, what did he lie about? He didn't lie right. about anything. He didn't lie about anything. Exactly. And then why is he even there? Right. Well, that's another piece, right? What is, what do serpents stand for in the ancient Near East? One of the things they stand for is knowledge. So, you know, I'm pretty oh, sure. interesting. They are the bringers of knowledge at times, uh, not this issue of temptation so much, but 
knowledge and healing. Actually, it's really fun to travel in. I've been able to do some traveling in the past and to some of these ancient sites related to biblical places and to see how prevalent, you know, the the God of healing is, for instance, in the presence of snake serpents or depictions of serpents. Yes, and snakes. Yes, and exactly. Exactly. And, you, and then I think of the Gnostics that were known as the Nascenes. And that's the Nascenes is like, it means like snake people, right? Hmm. I'm not familiar with that particular okay. collection. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not linguistic. I think the Nahash is like, means serpent in, her, in Hebrew, I think. Okay. But, uh, but not Nascenes. But I'm, but, like I said, I, I don't know. That's that's fine. Yeah, I'm, I'm literally just going off what I've heard somewhere, so I could be wrong. But um, but which brings us to the next question. Actually, it's a good, this is actually a decent segue. Is that in Genesis three six, Eve notices the tree was desired to make one wise. Now, we were just talking about you know the knowledge of good and evil, and you know how it brings you death and all that <laughs> stuff. But the Bible itself. For example, in Proverbs 14, Proverbs 19, 2, Proverbs 20, 20, you guys can look this up on your own. This is all, these are all passages that talk about wisdom being the way of the godly. Like you should see basically <laughs> Proverbs of you should seek wisdom and knowledge. Exactly. So it's like, <laughs> so the question is, why do we get the impression that the tree of knowledge gives us death if the rest of the Bible wants you to have knowledge? I know. <laughs> Thank you, Gnostic informant. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, there's a group of biblical scholars who got together to look for Sophia, which is wisdom in Greek, who is the, the Greek counterpart to Hochma, who is wisdom in Hebrew. So in those Proverbs, Hochma is who you're talking about, right? She, wisdom, calls out from the streets, right? And tries to, we could, that's a different conversation, talk about the foolish woman but but wisdom is personified as a female partly because the the language it's a feminine noun mm -hmm. but yeah wisdom is to be desired it is a good thing and so there's a collection let me fill through on that particular um thought that searching the scriptures is actually a collection of the different elements of christian and jewish scriptures that do elevate and celebrate sophia as a good thing and so there's a two volume set on that that's really quite powerful and interesting but yeah, back to your question, why in verse six, it says, right? So the woman saw that the tree was good for food and it was a delight to the eyes and the tree was to be desired to make one wise. Like what, where's the problem here? <laughs> right. She took some of it and ate and she gave some to her man who was with her and he ate. I also like to challenge the, the English translations that turn that use uh, married labels because there aren't married labels in the Hebrew. So I always say instead of husband and wife, I always say man and woman, but oh, nice. yeah, yeah. She's, yeah, she's actually courageous and curious and, in, and, and interested in knowledge. What's, what's the problem here? You know? Right. Right. And then I, I just thought of something. I'm, 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 this is in the Catholic Bible with, I think this is one of the books that the Protestants took out, but it's called the wisdom of Solomon. That's right. Yeah. And it, <laughs> If, you're, if anyone who's watching this is familiar with this text, it's praising Sophia all throughout the text. <laughs> it even goes so far. I, I put my finger on this part. It even says that wisdom preserved the first form father of the world when he alone had been created. And right before that, it says she who is one can do all things. Like it's like basically saying wisdom, she, her. Mm -hmm. In the feminine sense, and like as if she's the creator of all things. Oh, Proverbs chapter. I didn't even think about this until you were just until you were doing this. Proverbs chapter is it eight or nine? Has essentially what I often refer to as a third creation story. So the Lord created me at the beginning of His work, and there's a debate about if that means the first thing or whatever. But the point is me being hokma wisdom. Yeah. yeah. So wisdom is the first thing created, right? the first of his acts of long ago, ages ago, I was set up at the first before the beginning of the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs abounding with water, before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills, I was brought forth. When he had not yet made earth and fields or the world's first bits of soil. When he established the heavens, I was there. 
When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he established the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limit so that the waters might not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him like a master worker. Wow. And yeah, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world and delighting in the human race. I mean, why don't we talk about this passage? And the, que <laughs> the question is, when did the logos become a male? Oh my gosh. You're like, <laughs> wait, have you been reading some of my, I'm like, wait a minute. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why I wanted to have you on because I wanted to, this is this is like a place it's huge into great stuff, a lot of the stuff it? I've learned from your book, you know. Nice, nice, yeah. But yeah, like, and that, that's what I think that because now Christians take that as Jesus, right? Well, a lot of Baptist right. churches exactly. and stuff. But yeah. if you read the text, it's feminine. Nice. It clearly is feminine. It's, it's like Hakmas Sophia, the Greek version, and it says her. It, it never in Proverbs does it say he. It always says it's her. a feminine noun. Yeah. yeah. The Hebrew word chokhmah is a feminine noun. So yeah, they're going to turn it into a female. And then yes, where did the logos come from? I do actually have a video trying to show, d delineate this image, this idea of the logos as the, the thing from which everything was created. And it's, it's a Greek, um, it's a Greek creation story. And so I kind of worked through that in a, another video that I created. Um, if, it, if people are interested, I can send you the link to that. It's also linked on my YouTube channel. But but yeah, I mean, it's it's a great question, Neil, and it's an important one that we're so, we've been so trained to look at John 1, those first five verses or so that talk about God creating the world, you know, through using the Logos, nothing came into being without, without me, everything that came into being came into being through the Logos, right? So it's a parallel to this Sophia, and it's a Greek idea, and the, Joss, the Gospel of John is, a Greek, is appealing to a Greek audience, so it makes sense that, that they, the author would do that, you know. And just most people have never heard of this one in Proverbs chapter 8. Yeah, and then that's not even I, – I, I was bringing up a book that's in Catholic Bibles and took it to uh, Protestant Bibles. Proverbs is in every Bible. That's exactly. <laughs> You were reading from yes, yeah. you're reading from another source, which is also beautiful and yeah. powerful. And then this is this is right there for everybody. Most people have yeah, never heard of it. That's yep. across the board. You, you're not hiding exactly. from that one. Exactly. <laughs> so I got another question regarding the same passage in, in Genesis, and it's the serpent still. Mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. So the serpent in the garden gets cursed by God, and he's cast from heaven. So these the, this gets into Christian theology versus Jewish theology. We'll, we'll get into that, but. Satan first appears in Job. He's basically like God's district attorney. That's what he's like. Let's 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 test out, see if Job is really as good as you think he is, and put him on trial, basically. And then so so why when Christians get the impression that the serpent is Satan, and why is he standing next to God in Job if he was already cast down? If he was the serpent, mm -hmm, he's cast mm -hmm. down from heaven before the events of Job. Then why is he back up there with say, with God? talking about Job. Okay. So there are two different things here. Right. Just want to clarify or kind of parse out a little bit. Yes. Most Christians believe that Satan is there in chapter three of Genesis, but, but there is no mention of Satan or, or Hasatan. Yeah. It is just a serpent. Yes. And in, when we get to the book of revelation, Satan is the character. Satan is referred to in this kind of dragon and these other kinds of ways, but, but, those are those need to be kept uh not need to be um you know i think it's important to think about these as separate things and this serpent is is i think it's better to try to understand why they did bring in a serpent like you were saying before what why is the serpent there partly because there's an issue going on with other religious traditions around the israelite people who did have serpents as a part of their worship and so this is one way to denigrate and to tell people to stay away from. Um, it may have also been just an honest, earnest way of referring to um, a character who does bring in knowledge. And it might not have necessarily been a negative thing to have the serpent be the one leading them into knowledge. And finally, at the end of in the when the kind of the the consequences are, are given out at the end of chapter three, you know, the serpent's there partly because Kids are curious how in the world it is that snakes slither, like get around without legs. I mean, it's kind of a good question, you know? 
Right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so what we have in Genesis 3 doesn't have anything to do with Satan or even any kind of deception. And that's why I tried to phrase it that way. And I love that you asked the question. The only deception going on is if we read it as historically accurate, as if God would say, right. don't touch this and you'll die. They do touch it. They don't die. Blah, yeah. blah, blah. But go ahead. I was going to say real quick. He's not accusing anyone either. If exactly. Satan, Satan literally means the ha Satan literally means the accuser, if I'm not mistaken. Hasatan. Well, yeah, you know, it's interesting. I actually had a back and forth with my editor when I was writing that part of my book because she was respecting what the dictionary said, that the, the, the interpretation or the meaning of Hasatan is in the book of Job. And, and you know, it's kind of like, who are you going to ask to define a term? Someone who has who has preconceived ideas about this character, Satan? Or someone who has a, who has no stake in what you call, how you understand Satan, and you're going to respect the ancient Near Eastern context. And so, when I look at the beginning chapters of Job, I don't see someone who's accusing anyone. I see where we get the concept of the devil's advocate. I just see someone saying, "God is out there saying, have you seen my guy Job? He is amazing." And Satan's like, um, "Yeah, but what if?" <laughs> What if you think he's so amazing because he never stops praising you? Like, right. I don't see that as a deceiver or even I don't see that as a negative character. I see that as your best friend who makes sure you're not missing something. Right. Yeah. So, you know, I, I don't even remember what we came down on in, in the book in terms of how we talked about the character Hasatan, but he's and he's a he as a challenger of some sort, but just to try to get clarity on the situation. Right. Yeah. Are well, you that's, that's why I said that's why I said district attorney because yeah. it seems he's just doing his job. It seems like, right? Like, it seems like that's just his role, right? And also, what people often don't stop to think about is that Hasatan is welcome at this morning, you know, check in. Like God brings in his his you know board of advisors every morning and says, "So what's going on? What I miss every night?" You know, and Hasatan is welcome in the group. Hasatan is the first person or the first character that God turns to and says, hey, what you been up to? You know, like there's no antagonism here. Um, God is trusting his advisor, Hasatan. And Hasatan says, yeah, I've just been walking around, checking things out. You know, a lot of Christians are taught to read that as really negative, that I've been trying to figure out where I can mess with people. Right. It's just walking around, you know. Right. God's like, did you notice Job, my servant, and how amazing he is? He's like, yeah, but I think that might be because X, Y, Z, you know. And then you got to then to add to what you're saying, if he's allowed to be there, if he's allowed to go back and forth, right? He's not. This like, is a, why if he's an evil yeah, arch right. enemy, then why exactly. would he be allowed to go back and forth from exactly. Earth to heaven all day whenever he chooses? Exactly. Me, that's not, something's going on there. That absolutely that comes out of decades and centuries of development of thought, right? Yeah. Hasatan is a necessary character in the book of Job. Yeah. He is. It you know, you just got to how do you, again, it's kind of one of those how do you set up the conversation to see and and that also it and then I don't know that you want to necessarily get into this, but I also think that many people misunderstand what the book of Job is about and because of its the timing of it, when it was written, and the elements of the history of Judaic or or Israelite thought and religious practice, most biblical scholars will will tell you that the Book of Job is actually trying to contend with this belief that if you worship God, all will go well, and when things go south, it's because you've stopped worshiping God, and that's. That comes out of the very, very common, very popular tradition in the Hebrew Bible that says that. And so Job is actually challenging that that's to basically say sometimes shit just happens. Right. And period. No and, bow at the end. Right. And I noticed that his friends, they're mm -hmm. like, basically, they almost act like they're people of the Dharma faith where it's everything's all karma and yeah, yeah. you get what you deserve, basically. <laughs> Something bad's happened to you, Joe. You did something wrong. You better it, admit it. Exactly. But also that is very true to the 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 prophets, the 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 um the former prophets, the latter prophets, the book of Deuteronomy, all of those writings can 
endorse this way of thinking, right? So the book of Joshua, Judges, all of them, first and second Kings, first and second Samuel, they talk about it this way. So for his friends to be saying, what did you, you had to do something wrong. That's, that's the representation of the Jewish, the, the Israelite people's religious beliefs. And Job is standing in as the never done anything wrong. And yet some serious stuff has gone down. And so that's where people miss people start to see that and they say well god's just testing job god's just seeing how long he can handle it and really i think it's a very early in attempt to wrestle with sometimes stuff just happens and i don't think they get it right i think they get they make some strides i don't think it's perfect and the problem is we have it canonized uh, some editors came along at the end and added on some nicey nice at the end, which totally undermines the whole point of the book, you know? And so anyway, I think the book of Job is highly misunderstood. <laughs> I agree. I agree. And I was thinking about this going back to Satan now. Okay. Do you think that dualism influenced Christianity in the sense that all of a sudden now you have evil and good and you have all these characters that are not the same, like for example, um, they, they, they lump in Lucifer with Satan. They, they lump in the scapegoat from the book. I think it's the book mm -hmm. of numbers, mm -hmm. uh, Azazel, who's in the book of Enoch, by the way, which is really weird. He falls from heaven. All these characters get lumped in as like, mm -hmm. as like the devil. Yep. And there's like a big pot that stirred you know, around. Yeah. Then you see the imagery in the middle ages where he's got the horns and all that. And all of a sudden yeah. he becomes this completely different character. Yeah. And you have to wonder, is it influenced by dualism? Like what's going on there? Okay. Yeah. And actually that's why I recommended the book, the quest, the quest for the historical Satan by Miguel de la Torre. It's, he does a lot of, he, mostly he does theology and really trying to help people kind of progress in their, their theological thinking. But this book is, so it's, I don't remember what year he published it, but it's, It'll give you way more than you even wanted to know in terms of the development of the thought around Satan or the devil or whatever, and where some of those the pieces come from, like why why red, why horns, why all of that, like that comes right. out of ancient Persian thought, ancient Mesopotamian thought, or Egyptian thought. You know, so he he covers that. But you're right. One so one of the things I like to just to offer then on this conversation is to consider that. A, Hasatan was not originally out to get anyone, and Hasatan is not in Genesis. So that is purely just a serpent having a conversation with a human as you do, right? Worth considering that actually doesn't happen. So another element of the mythic piece going on there. But when Hasatan does show up, Hasatan is really just, just kind of playing the devil's advocate. That's what his role is to make sure God doesn't overlook something important, but it's, and we don't, and Lucifer is another character entirely, the, the light bearer. And, you know, I was looking up the two passages in the Hebrew Bible that do, that people tend to point to for Satan. And it's just there, Ezekiel and Isaiah 14, they have nothing to do with a devil, a Satan or anyone evil. They are foreign leaders. Let's right. just let them be that. Right. And so it's the book of Revelation that gets really confusing and that people get really wound up about and around. And again, it's literature. It's not it's not predicting the future. These aren't real characters. This is literature. And we're trying to talk about the Roman Empire in metaphorical terms. And Right. And maybe that I'm, you almost have to wonder if the, if the author of Revelation was influenced by dualism. I to to get to your question about dualism. Sorry, I didn't mean to oh, I didn't, I didn't mean deflect to, that. Yeah. No, I see dualistic thought throughout. It's heavy in Paul's writings. It's the the most popular gospel today. It's at least around more conservative and evangelical groups is the Gospel of John because it's there's a lot of clear cut yes and no thinking, yeah. which is completely dualistic and right. it's very harmful in the end. I, I didn't I didn't mean to cut you off though. You no, no. You were it's talking fine. about Revelation. Please, please continue. I'm sorry about that. It's okay. No, it's fine. It's totally fine. We're having a conversation here. It's right, great. Right. But but so so both pieces, right? I think that I th it's important to me when I have people I'm having a conversation with, it's really important to me to highlight the dualistic nature of much of the content of Christian thinking because it's drawing from a really important writings in the Newer Testament. And it's important to me to note that dualistic thinking is really important for children. 
and really important for them before they can before they can handle nuances in terms of ethical conversations. And that's why taking, say, a philosophy or an ethics course in undergrad is really helpful because you're you've given a chance to do this for the first time in really important contexts where it's safe. But the scriptures don't ever give you an adult version of these things. And so people in faith community, in Christian communities, are still reading dualistic writings. And Paul's thought is heavily dualistic. And it's it's right or wrong. It's you're with us or you're against us. That's a very prevalent framework within Christian writings. And so when people today uphold that way of thinking, I want to be really compassionate about that, but I also want to be clear that it's not mature. Right? Yeah. No, I was just, I, that, I was just thinking that when you said that. It's so funny how you said that word. I was literally thinking it's very, it's a very immature yeah. way to look at the world. Exactly. Good versus bad and dark versus white. Exactly. Really, really. It's like a childish way to look at the it world. Is. It really is. It is. It is. And, and we need a chance to grow up in the faith it, for those who, for whom these are important sacred scriptures. Yeah. It, it reminds me of that scene. Everyone, ever seen the movie Donnie Darko? Yeah. <laughs> it reminds me of the scene where he's in the classroom and she's like, she like points to the board and it's like good and evil. You can't just lump things into two categories. Things aren't that simple. The lifeline is divided that way. But you're not listening to me. There are other things that need to be taken into account here, like the whole spectrum of human emotion. You can't just lump everything into these two categories and then just deny everything else. And then he gets up and he says something along the lines of, the world's not, the world's not as simple as you make it out to be. It's a lot more, like, that's what that reminds me of. Yeah, it should. Yeah. I mean, that, that you know, once we hit 10 or so, <laughs> we can start to handle complexities versus simplicity, right? Yeah. And we need the simplicity for starting. We need a good grounding, right? But you're right. The world is lots of gray and colors in between black and white, right? And so what happens is you get these later, and this is later on, this is way like deep into the church years, where you get these Christians who just lump all of these Hades, uh, mm -hmm. Lucifer, who, by That's the right. way, Lucifer was never even evil. He, he was right. just a Venus's brother or something like whatever a light bearer yeah he was a light bringer right? what's wrong with that <laughs> yeah. so you, you, they lump him in with satan and then the serpent in the garden and yes. uh azazel that's satan yes. too they're all satan anger right. manu beelzebub yeah. yeah beelzebub yeah exactly and they're all these different characters that are meant for different things yes. just become evil incarnate exactly and that's that's why I have this image in my head of this big pot of everything being thrown in there and stirred together, and they all mean the same thing when they really, really don't. They really don't. And really and then don't. and then like like you mentioned, Paul. Yeah. Paul says things throughout his writings like, "Oh, you'll be given over to Satan," as if I Satan has like in in the underworld, like Hades, like it's an embodied sitting there, like I'm the king of hell. Yes. Like, where, where there's no, I don't think there's any scripture that says that he's the king of hell. Right. No. Correct. Correct. <laughs> Yeah. When Paul says that in First Corinthians five, it's a little startling. Like to hand him over to Satan. Like, oh, yeah. what do you actually like? Is there a guard in the jail cell or something that's like gonna beat the crap out of him for having sex with his stepmom? I mean, I don't know. Like, right? right. Yeah. But but Paul does make that reference. So we have in Christian writings, we have people. We have a reason for people to believe in the literal embodiment of evil as a in a sort of personified kind of a way. We have that set up for us as well as in Corinthians, excuse me, Colossians and Ephesians and talking about the spiritual realms and all that stuff. But yeah, people, you know, Christians have the example set for, for them on that. Right. Yeah. So and the next question I have for you is about Pelagius. And yes. Can you tell us people, probably, some people probably have no idea who he is at all. So maybe we can do right. a little overview on him and then talk about why he's labeled as a heretic. Yeah, I'll make this short, partly because you can go look up stuff about him if you want. Sure. And I hadn't heard of him either until I got to seminary. So the, the quick breakdown here is Pelagius is mid to late fourth century, and he's about the same time as Augustine. And the thing is, Augustine's voice won. But Pelagius has some really interesting ideas, such as, and the most important one is, he did not believe in the, the doctrine of original sin, the way it's talked about in, by Paul in the Newer Testament writings, and then the way Augustine and his contemporaries were talking about original sin. So they were reading into Genesis chapter 3 that those two humans were being disobedient, and because they're disobedient, we all die. We all 
do not get to have immortal life. That we don't get immortality. And the thing is, Genesis never says that we would have had it. So it's like, okay, it's all misreadings, just to be clear. Okay, so Paul and everybody is reading, misreading into Genesis 3, this concept of the disobedience is original sin. And then since we all descend from these two, that we all inherit this kind of thing within us. We're born into this world sinful, and we were born into this world deserving some form of death because of this sinfulness. And it's also stunning to me that nobody else stopped to say, I don't think that makes sense. But anyway, people didn't, and they just tr carried on with these ideas. So Pelagius says, yeah, I don't buy that. I, I think that we're born who we are, and we're, we have the we have the capacity to make good choices and bad choices, and it's on us. It's not because of some ancestor who made a bad choice and tainted me because of it. He just said no to the original sin, and that, along with a list of eight or nine other things, were ideas that were deemed heretical. So if you agreed with Pelagius and these heretical ideas he had, you were to be excommunicated. You were not People were not to associate with you if you believed in these things. Um, and so, for instance, I, I have them print. I have several of them printed out. Let me just read one or two just to give yeah. you an idea. Adam, the first human being, again, not anyway, was created mortal. This is what Pelagius thinks, thought, so that whether he sinned or not, he would have died from natural causes and not because of the wages of sin. Guess what? That Genesis three upholds that. Paul's misreading of it is where we get this other idea. He, so essentially, he's just an honest, good humanitarian, basically, right? Um, that the grace of God by which we are justified through Jesus Christ avails. Uh, that's not the one I want to read. Uh, newborn children need not be baptized or that they are baptized for the remission of sins, but that no original sin is derived from Adam. I mean, he just. That's the word the Protestants were getting at later on. Yeah. Martin Luther was big on that. Yeah. yeah. See, he had so he was a little bit ahead of his time, it seems like. Yeah. Totally. And that's why they, they couldn't handle it. And way, way more people agreed with Augustine, which is stunning, really, that people would rather think that God was OK with this idea that they were giving to God, that God created humans. And then to be the curious humans that we are and for being that curious was going to punish us with some sort of death for being wanting knowledge. Like, what the hell? Right. Why and is that? And Augustine's one of the ones who are like, w women are evil. They're the problem, yeah. all this stuff. Oh God, oh God, oh I'm working on a book right now it's where just, I have to deal with Augustine's thoughts on women and sex. And it's yeah, so it's bad. Lot. It's so bad. Just yeah. if anyone's out there, go check it out. But I'm warning you. It's, it's tense. It's, it's intense. bad. And yeah. it's like, yeah. but it's so mind blowing that someone like that is remembered and like thought of as like this great theologian, right? Like Pelagius with all these really interesting points of view exactly on, he's a heretic get rid of him forget exactly him. yeah yeah and to this day if you look up if you do wiki you know go google him or whatever people are still calling pelagius a heretic but there are some people within christian traditions that are reclaiming him saying yeah actually i'm a i'm a pelagian thank you very much you know which is um, good yeah that's yeah. good and like how dare you say that god is good and has a plan i know like i, I, I don't know. Know. <laughs> yeah but right. Those were the times then, you know, and yeah. so it's, it's easy yeah. for us in this time in the era to look back and it is. The finger. But we're on the backs of all these people, all these social justice movements before us that yeah. really led the way and shaped our worldviews. And we got to we got to remember that, you know. Absolutely. Yep. I think that's important. Yeah. It's so easy to do. Yeah. Is that is that was that the last thing you wanted to say? I about think that's good for Pelagius in terms of understanding him and yeah, in relation to Genesis chapter three, right? Yeah, he was trying to free us from what the early church was saying and misreading yeah. there. And I, yeah, and so I he agree. was, yeah. Oh, and by the way, real quick before I get to the next question, um, I when you talk because you, you you keep uh, reminding us that Adam is not the first man, which I I love by the way because the reason why I love it is because when I first started learning Hebrew. I, I've been uh, doing like the Rosetta, Rosetta Stone app, and I found out that the word Adom means red. The word for man is Ish. And I'm like, wait a minute. I've been told growing up by Christians in the church that Adam means man. Where did that even come? It's not, it's not even true, if I'm not mistaken. Was that where did that happen? Yeah. It, I mean, that, ha Adam or it, Ha is the definite article. So Adam is is human and in kind of the generic 
generic sense as in that a human mean, being but it doesn't mean man at all it doesn't but it, but it it's turned into that because of biases of the inter the translation committees interesting right those kinds of things so we get the name adam from ha adam and so then that kind of bolsters the whole belief that adam means man where like you said ish if you look at the hebrew in chapter in that chapter you get ish and isha at, as soon as we have two and those are the nouns for man and woman which is like the first thing you learn in hebrew yeah like the first step one learn how to say the word man and woman <laughs> wait a minute i'm already deconstructing what my th i'm like oh my god I, yeah. I have so much to learn like i don't know anything yeah <laughs> yeah there's I, a lot I, I literally thought up until a couple of years ago that the word for man in hebrew was adam yeah yeah that's why you're, not alone. Yeah, yeah, you're a lot not alone yeah but anyways just want to get that out there mm -hmm. you point out that paul talks about the church of god as being mm. a church within judaism and then acts talks about antioch the first place where christians call themselves people call themselves christians paul claims he only knew peter and james but acts tells a different story yeah but when do you think christianity officially became its own separate entity okay so to address that specific question i i do want to clarify that yes i, I say that about the the community within that paul is talking about is within judaism and the i'm not and he calls them an ecclesia and so an ecclesia was already a thing that existed that's a political group or a social group primarily they were groups that either had to do with politics or they were the groups that made sure someone buried you when you died hmm. which has an interesting connection to churches today by the way but anyway really keep moving, when yeah. you think about it right um so paul to, to break it down as simply as I can, I think of Paul as start is bringing Gentiles into Judaism. And because he was doing that, it meant that the Judaism in that space looked very different from regular, if you'll just b bear with me on that kind of sure. phrasing. So regular Judaism wasn't about bringing people in. It wasn't a proselytizing religion. It never has been, right? right. And, and the makeup in that space then was predominantly Gentile, not entirely. And that's a thing to, to wrestle with and figure out and, and to see and to wrap our heads around why other Jews would look at this sect of Judaism and say, they're the Christ, the Christ ones, that negative slur is what Christian was initially being used by Jews over here to refer to that heretical sect of Judaism over there. And so it started out that way. The label Christian that we know of was used first used in the year 67. But as I said, it was a slur and it was used within Judaism from this group to that group. And this but but we can see a separation that early. So when we talk about when did what is now Christianity fully separate from the rest of Judaism? We usually say around the year 127, 125, common era, something like that. But that's when there's kind of this general agreement that this sect of Judaism is behaving so dramatically differently. We as Jews don't recognize them. And these, this group of the sect of Judaism is claiming these thoughts that make it seem like they are they're the shit like they've got the tradition this is the way to understand everything and so there's this mutual like disowning or whatever separation i think sure. so it's a tricky question um but i do i also like the the follow-up question that you have there is it safe to say that christianity as a distinct religion from judaism began outside of judea and i think that's yeah. absolutely absolutely spot on yeah. i mean hands down if you and if you look at the history, you see that their early Christian theologians are like in Alexandria or in Syria. Yes, like the first bishops and popes. Yes. they're all that's in right. Syria or Turkey or that's right. They're not in it. They're not in Jerusalem. That's right. That's know? right. And that yep. is something that I should point out. You know. Yeah. No, that's a great observation, and especially if you start to look into church history conversations there will occasionally be someone from Jerusalem. They're not the ones that get to win the day. They're not the prominent yeah. voice. Right. And yeah, when, and then the other thing I wanted to bring up, which is because of the way you phrased this question, is the difference between what Paul says or what we get from his genuine letters and then what we get 
depicted in the book of Acts. And there's a lot to say there, so I won't go dive, I won't dive deep, but I think it's an important thing to bring up because most people, regardless of your affiliations, have heard the story from the version of events that comes that's depicted in the book of Acts. And that wasn't written until 120 common era or so. Right. So it's a hundred years after the events started happening that it's depicting. Right. Yeah. Paul, however, is writing right in the midst of things. And Paul and the disciples of Jesus actually have a difference of opinion on things. And we get in Acts essentially what comes down from Jesus's disciples and their tradition. So it's I wanted to raise that point for people who are interested right. in this to no, pay I attention. It's not. Go ahead. Well, the, re the reason why I wanted to jump in is because you can find those disagreements in the text. Easily, easily. Now, now, I know in James, it wasn't written by the actual James, but you can see why they attributed it to him because you could see a theology that's based off. He's, he's, it seems like he's arguing with Paul and he's saying things like, you ignoramus, it's not about just faith. You got to do works. <laughs> show, do the works to show your faith. And he's like, that's how you. And then Paul in Romans is like, just have faith and faith is alone will get you saved. And, you know, it, it's through Abraham's faith is why he had good works. It's like they're, chicken, they're arguing over the chicken and the egg is basically what they're arguing over. Which is which ones comes first, faith or works? Yeah. That's you, like I said, you, you could see the disagreements in the, in the epistles. You can. And at least my two cents on that is Paul is was really interested in. Essentially, there are two tickets into the party. You're a Jew, so you use the covenant, which means you live according to the laws and you love each other and you love God. If you're not a Jew, then you're a Gentile and you get into this party by the death of, of Jesus, the execution and resurrection of this guy, Jesus, and how that applies to you. So that's just a belief thing. Judaism is living up, living well together thing. So I think that that, that argument about faith versus works is comes out of we still need the Gentiles to live well and be good humans. Right. But from Paul's perspective, he's just trying to talk about how you get in the door and yeah, how you get in the good. door is different. Right. So I, you know, it's. Oh. And that's why, <laughs> that's why back to Romans, he's always, he's like, well, some people are going to get oh. offended by meat sacrifice to idols. Some aren't, you know, we know it's not a big deal, but. Let's try to be let's try to be inclusive here. Sensitive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. you can see how he's trying to market it to a wide range of people instead of being like, here's the rules. If you don't follow these rules, get out. Mm -hmm. He's trying to be like, well, there are rules. You should follow them. But if you can't, you can't. And at least you try. Just have faith. <laughs> it's like it. you almost kind of it's almost sort of you almost sort of have to like admire it a little bit because mm -hmm. he's really he's trying to. He's really trying to be inclusive. It seems He's like. clever. Yeah. yeah. He so, is all things to all people, I think, in his letters. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And that's funny how he says that because he calls Peter a liar. <laughs> he says that Peter is one way to certain people, and then he's behind their backs is another person. And then two pages later, well, not two pages, but like later in the text, he's like, I'm one thing to the Gentiles, and I'm one thing to the Jews. I'm, one th I'm, exactly. I'm all things to all. It's like, you just called Peter whatever, dude. <laughs> yep. But um, yeah, the last question. Okay. John 652. Oh, gosh. Yeah. yeah. Just a <laughs> and, little light. Uh, yeah. Some people of the Jewish faith would say this is blasphemous. Drinking blood and eating flesh is cannibalism. What do you think Jesus or the writer of John meant to convey by this passage? Is it safe to say that this is influenced by Greco-Roman traditions, Mithra, Bacchus, mysteries of Eleusis, all this stuff? Yeah. I mean, it's very easy, simple response. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's lifted from the Mithraic ritual. Like, <laughs> like the first time I read about Mithras and the initiates into Mithraism, I was like, what? That's where Paul got that language. Yeah, it's I've read it through Mary Bird's uh, relig Religions of Rome book. And okay, like, great. Oh, this is like Christianity. That is exactly where Paul gets it. It's from these other religious traditions. I mean... And I like to talk about in order to try to make sense of this, this element. So when I first heard that claim, it, it freaked me out because it was like, God was inspiring Paul. God was inspiring Paul. I'm like, well, actually, Paul was inspired by these other ideas around him. And he just adapts them to talk about Jesus. And if you look at the, the models of salvation is the way I think about it, or I talk about it with people. He uses five or six different 
frameworks or systems to make sense of this person's death gives other people some form of salvation. How does that work? And how is God, Jesus, and the people working in that? And I, I, there, it's not like I did this work. I'm drawing on other scholars who've done this work. And so I have a chart of different models of salvation. And one of them is Jewish, right? The animal sacrificial atonement kind of a thing, right? This animal, you know, covers my sin or takes my sin or whatever, right? And I'm back in good standing with God. But the rest come from, where do they come from? The world that Paul was living in and was interacting with. And so he's appealing to all these people based on what they already knew and were familiar with, right? Right. It's Roman. The Roman religion converts, basically. Right? I mean. Gre Greek and Roman. Yeah. 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 Like, it's like, yeah. it's almost like the Roman, Romans have their own religion, whether you want to call it the Roman imperial cult or whatever. But throughout the centuries, the, the church, it's the, the Roman religion itself converts as a whole to, into Christianity. Like they, they like, they like mesh together and become one thing. It seems like. Because yeah, it already appealed. It already had an appeal because initially the ideas of Christianity were drawn from the people to begin with, right? All the different gods and goddesses, um, the, the, there, there are two prompt. So we're, I'm trying to stick with your original prompt just because I can do tangents all day. But, you know, so the issue of the ingesting the body and drinking the blood, that sounds to me as, as if it comes right out of the Mithraic initiation, because they would, they would, the blood would wash over the person, maybe they'd be standing under the platform and the platform has slats in it so that when they, they kill the animal that represents the God, then the blood washes over the person. And then they have a barbecue, they cook the meat and they eat the meat and the meat represents the God. You ingest the God, the God is in you, you are in the God. We see that in Paul's letters, you know, yeah. I mean, it's just right there. It's very powerful. So do you think this is a later a tri a attribution to Jesus's words? Or do you think maybe it's possible he actually did say that? This is my blood. Drink from my blood. I don't think he did. No, I don't think he And did. I do think that I'm not, I'm not a mythicist. But no, I, no. I definitely think there was a guy. But I don't think he the Eucharist thing was a real historical event. Yeah, the concept of eating my flesh and drinking my blood that is in there is... I, I I have no way to make sense of that as historically accurate. It is entirely theological because yeah. John's gospel is heavily theological. And they're working with all these ideas that have been out there for a while. Thank the you, logos. Paul. Yeah, exactly. They're That's, working. That goes yeah. back hundreds yeah. of years before John. Right. Exactly. He uses it right off the bat. Exactly. Beginning was the law. So yep. it's a very Hellenized. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And very theological. Whereas the synoptics, the first three are more. This is a human who walked on the earth and this is the stuff he did. And this is what got him in trouble was speaking up for social justice. And, you know, that's, that's a good point. You know, just real quick, just before we end do yeah. you think that word logos, do you think that's a good translation for his word? Uh, yes and no, no, because of what the Christian tradition in general has done with this concept of word and it comes from John. So using yeah. John's idea of the word of God or the word was with God, actually the Greek there says the word was moving toward God. That's why I like that, that short um, video that I created to help show this, demonstrate this. But I mean, and, and I mean, it's complicated. I think that in the Greek context, word doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It's more like stuff. It's like mm -hmm. this pre-existent matter, not word, you know? Yeah, yeah. So I actually don't think that it's the best translation, but. And then you got Philo talking about how it's the glue that holds everything together. It's, yeah. So there's a lot of yeah. weird in, spins on people using that word in, in different, different uh, philosophers or texts and all that stuff. Absolutely. But I think I think when it gets translated into word and it just stays that way, I think we lose a lot of context of what it actually means. Agree. It's, like, it's like reason. It's like uh, yes, you know, wisdom and all that. Yes. Yep. Closer to that for yeah. sure. But yeah, so the links are in the description for the book giveaway. Is that what it is? Yeah. Yeah. Giveaway tomorrow. Yep. Yep. And uh, so yeah, this will be if you're if you're watching this when it first came out, it, then check it out. You'll be able to get there. 
if you're watching this like a week from now, then <laughs> sorry, <laughs> it started on the 17th, so yeah. whatever. <laughs> but yeah, there's also links in the description for books and stuff that you have uh, that I mentioned in the in the intro. And mm -hmm. is there anything else that you want to say that before we close out? No, this has been a fun conversation. I hope I hope others get something out of it. <laughs> this has been really fun. Really, I really enjoyed it. And we gotta do it again soon. Thank you. Um, and like I always say, you have just attained true gnosis. You have just attained true gnosis. The Demiurge has no power over.